Terrificon is back. The terrific Comic Con, devoted to what else? Comic books and their creators, returns to Mohegan Sun Expo Center in Connecticut. The three day event features the largest gathering of comic book writers and artists, the largest of its kind in New England, is on August 9th through the 11th. Terrific Con producer Mitch Halleck promises this year's event will be the best con he's ever produced with today's top talent like Tom King. Donnie Cates, Ryan Stegman, Clay Mann, Liam Sharp, Derek Robertson, plus legendary creators Jim Steranko, Chris Claremont, Jim Starlin, Jerry Ordway, and in his final con appearance, the one and only George Perez. Terrificon will be celebrating Batman's anniversary, as well as featuring actors from the Bat films, Billy D. Williams, Robert Wool, and Val Kilmer, plus Doctor Who's John Barrowman, The Flash's John Wesley Shipp, the voice cast reunion of Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain and lots more. See for yourself why Terrificon is summer's hottest Comic Con this August 9th through the 11th only at Mohegan Sun. For more information and guest list, visit Terrificon.com. It's terrific! Hey everybody, welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here, man, great conversation today. Jason Inman joins us to talk about his new book, Super Soldiers, Comics and Service Members. A great collection of essays, Jason's observations on uh, the comic strip and comic book history of characters who have military backgrounds. And uh, Jason talks about what they get right, what they get wrong. Jason should know from his own personal experience uh, serving uh, during the Iraq War. And uh, pretty amazing. Uh, We talk a lot about uh, what he did over there. And uh, also, uh, of course, about the book, certain characters that he focuses on. Uh, It's a great book. Plus, you know, Jason is a longtime friend of the program. He has been uh, working on the staff of the CBS television show The Code, which is a new uh, military uh, justice show. And we talk about that a bit. And then also... uh, we can't help it. We both love Star Trek, so we have to get into a conversation about Star Trek Discovery and uh, the Picard series that's coming up, because I respect Jason's opinion, and I wanted to know what he thought of what we got after these first two seasons of Discovery and what we might get with uh, Patrick Stewart's new show. So lots of fun. Jason Inman on today's Word Balloon. It's all brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your continued support through Patreon. Word Balloon, as I always say, is free. It will always be free. But uh, if you'd like to help the cause out, and I genuinely appreciate it, especially when I'm uh, still recovering from this uh, infection that I got at the end of last year, it's all improving, but it's uh, moving slowly. Uh, Faster than uh, they expected, the doctors, but not fast enough for me. Uh, But regardless, uh, you're helping me out by being a patron of Word Balloon via Patreon. So you can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon. Is Word Balloon worth a buck a month to you and the, the entertainment I try to provide? Is it worth the price of a comic book? If you think so, you can help me out by going to patreon.com slash wordballoon or clicking on the Patreon ad at wordballoon.com. Thank you, truly, for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, the industry's fastest-growing independent publishing company. As we've said many times, they're calling this year the year of reading dangerously. They're backing it up with some amazing books like Animosity from Marguerite Bennett and Garth Ennis' Walk Through Hell and Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis and Dark Ark from Colin Bunn and Juan Doe, Baby Teeth from Donny Cates, and books that just started uh, last month like Descendant by Stephanie Phillips and Killer Groove from Ollie Masters and Owen Marin, also Stronghold from Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly, Oberon from Ryan Parrott, Dark Red from Tim Seeley. Lots of great books, great genres, no holds barred. You never know what's going to happen in these books. And I think they have really interesting concepts and great creators to back it up. Now, in the days and weeks ahead, we'll have more talks with Aftershock creators about their products, but you don't have to wait. Check out their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Okay, without further ado, let's get into our conversation with Jason Inman about his new book, Super Soldiers, Comics and Service Members, right here on Word Balloon. Jason Inman, welcome back to Word Balloon. Uh, Hey, man, nice going. Everything seems to be, all the boats are uh, heading in the right direction these days, it seems. Do, are the boats going the right direction? I mean, I, I think the compass <laughs> seems like it's going in the right direction. So uh, from my perspective, so I hope that for everybody else's perspective, it's a yes. 
All right. I, well, I'm enjoying, and I and I first I of all, I appreciate that, man. Absolutely, man. No, everything's. It, uh, we were talking off the air, and you were telling me good things, and um, things we'll be getting into uh, in the conversation as well. Um, you just spent a season on uh, CBS's The Code. Yes. Tell me about that, real that, fast. Uh, so, so I'm the showrunner's assistant on CBS The Code, and the show is basically it's Jag Marine lawyers who are debating kind of like moral gray issues in the current military it's very unique it's it's not like a typical lawyer show and and the great thing about being a showrunner's assistant is you're basically showrunner junior you you shadow the showrunner all day every day you know talk to everybody that he talks to go to every meeting that he goes to you basically get trained to be a showrunner which is something that i've always wanted to do so it's 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 amazing it's 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 such a great job and also i will say this as a person who spent a long time in the internet critic world it exposes a side of entertainment that you never thought you'd see like you understand decisions certain decisions a lot uh simpler like you, you they make sense now gotcha i bet absolutely man well you're inside the beast and you kind of know right. where all the different like uh, opinions might be coming from that that you know result on the screen. So that's that's fantastic, Jason. Really, I'm I'm thrilled, and I know our buddy uh, Josh Falkoff also on the code, correct? That's right. Yeah, he was on our staff as well. It was really uh, we had a really great staff. We had um, uh, Craig Sweeney's the showrunner. He used okay. to work on the 4400. Oh, and he awesome. did the he sure ran uh, the Limitless CBS show. Sure, yes, and and yep, and he also worked on a Starter Discovery, and then. We had a bunch of amazing people. We had uh, Michael and Jelly, who is what was one of the co EPs of Battlestar Galactica. Yes, I um, remember that name certainly. Wow. Yeah, and then we had Anthony Swafford, who wrote Jarhead. So we had like oh, a cool. power hitter. We had a power hitter staff. Yeah, man. No, that's great. And seriously, I I do, and you know, obviously this will dovetail into uh, the book as well. But uh, no, I I I always like Jack, and I and I always think that. Um, what happens in the military and, and the, the business side of the military and, and the non-combat side of the military and the, the various facets, I think, are always really interesting. So uh, that's, well, that's cool. I, I will say this. It was, it, was, it was bandied about for a while to be like, can we do a JAG crossover? And then I think we learned that we couldn't. And I, whenever I got in the writer's room, my recurring joke was, all right, we'll let, ha- we'll let NCIS have JAG. <laughs> Our crossover needs to be Major Dad, and <laughs> and, <laughs> and now he's General Grandfather, and we we make it a giant shared universe. <laughs> Gerald McRaney is very happy to hear that somewhere. He's still listen. working, man. <laughs> he's great. I'm a big fan. Oh, you know, uh, Rucka is your your biggest Gerald McRaney fan because of Simon and Simon back in the day. So, oh yeah, well, know. also Deadwood is too. Of course, of course. Everything, my God, seriously, everything that guy does. Wasn't he in, um, God, now I can't remember the name of the show. Uh, uh, it was early 2000s, and um, Skeet Ulrich was like one of the leads, and it was all like. Was yeah. he in Jericho? That's what I was thinking. That it was Jericho, yes. Yeah, that's that's exactly. a good show, man. I wasn't sure. Jericho was a good show. Absolutely. It was a great idea. It's a shame. I forgot you know? he was on that show. You know, and now we're in this era where. Um, a show doesn't necessarily have to die because a network loses, you know, support for it. And I mean, God, I just talked to Joe Henderson as I was telling you off the air about Lucifer and what a great success story that is, and the Expanse certainly going to Amazon. Oh, the, both the both those shows are great, man. Yeah, we're not we're actually are we're really in a golden age of television. No it's, it, it's such there's so there's too much to watch. Like there's so much good stuff to watch. Hundred percent, man. No, and I'll even embarrassingly say that I haven't been watching the code, but uh, hearing you talk about it makes me like, oh, okay. I also wanted to try uh, David uh, Boreanaz's uh, CBS show too. And I know oh, Seal uh, Seal Team. Yeah, SEAL Team, exactly. Yes. So there's a couple like Navy SEAL shows out there, so I always get them confused. But okay. I know I think that's SEAL Team. Yeah, that's and, a good show too. And then uh, the one I got to catch before ABC yanks it off of uh, streaming is uh, Whiskey, um, whatever it is, the Spy Show. I hear Whis- that was a Whiskey fun... Tango. Yeah, Whiskey hear... Cavalier. Yeah, Whiskey Cavalier. That's what it is. I think Whiskey mm-hmm. Cavalier. Yeah, I hear that's a fun kind of show. I, I don't know. I'm gonna have to check it out before it goes away. Better hurry up, man. <laughs> I know. I'm hip. I know. I, I, know it, I know it got canceled. I'm going to have to see how long it'll uh, be sitting on, on demand before uh, before they yank it down. But anyway, yeah, the, go ahead. Yeah. I, well, I was going to say the thing the, the thing I like, if, if nobody out there has, has watched our show, The Code, the thing I like about it is that 
it does deal, like I said, with a lot of issues that people don't think about. Like our episode two, which is already aired, so this is not even spoilers, deals with a man who he was in an attack in Somalia. It was his first time in combat, and he had a panic attack. Now, he doesn't want to admit to his superiors that he had a panic attack because he thinks it'll make him look cowardly. So he just lies and lies and lies, and so he gets put on trial eventually for cowardice. And so the whole episode becomes, you know, because we would all have a panic attack the first time we were in combat. And the idea becomes, can you really charge somebody with cowardice? Which I think I was like, oh, that's a fascinating idea. That's one of the things where when I got hired on the show and I that was our episode two and I read that script, I was like, oh, thank God I'm on a good show. Oh, thank God. No, that's amazing, man. And I and I will uh, I will definitely check out the code. I've got CBS All Access, of course, for my uh, Star Trek fix. Um, there you go. It's on there. Yep. Got to be honest. Twilight Zone. Not feeling it. Um, I'm I'm with you on that one. I <laughs> am not a huge. I love the original, man. I've oh, seen every episode. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've had this discussion a lot with a lot of people lately in terms of Star Wars and that George Lucas might actually be the secret sauce of Star Wars and that Star Wars without George Lucas is just not as good. <laughs> and I've actually been thinking about that in terms of the Twilight Zone as well, because this is the third reboot the second reboot i'm third I'm, reboot i'm not certain because they did the third reboot and now i think i just think you, if it, if you don't have rod serling in the room you can't do twilight zone i understand what you're saying and i don't necessarily disagree although you know i didn't know that star trek our favorite thing iris Stephen bear did the upn twilight zone of the early 2000s the second i say i haven't seen that one yeah and um force whitaker was the serling host for that one. And actually, it had in, in particular one really special episode where it was a sequel to the Billy Mummy, uh, It's a Good Life. And it was Anthony mm-hmm. as an adult with a small child that has the same godlike powers. And even Cloris Leachman was back as uh, Anthony's mother. And, um, and it was interesting because Ira Bear was uh, given the possibility of running the show and he didn't want to do it. And one of his buddies is like, yeah, but if you don't do it, someone's going to screw it up. So you almost have to do it to just kind of honor. So you're saying that one that one is actually good? I know there were a couple episodes that I thought were pretty good. I know the uh, the CBS one from the mid '80s had a handful of interesting episodes, and J. Michael Straczynski and Marty Pasco among the people mm-hmm. that uh, wrote scripts for for that version. And again, um, but it was funny because uh, as I'm learning more behind the scenes, they uh, I think had the same problem with the current iteration on All Access. They get away from the Serling idea, and um, they become different shows under the you know in the hands of different showrunners. And it's like you know I I don't I mean I think Black Mirror is a good example of what you can do with Twilight Zone uh, kind of ideas and Outer Limits kind of ideas. And that's the other interesting thing is the '90s Outer Limits I thought was a, a decent show. I thought I thought it had I a did lot of too. I actually you know I actually liked it. Yeah. You know it's funny because I say. I do say that I think um, Black Mirror is the modern Twilight Zone. Yeah. I really do. A lot of people are like, well, it's about technology. And I'm like, no, but it's 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 literally Twilight Zone. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. That's how you modernize Twilight Zone is Black Mirror. Yeah, and I just kind of feel, and we'll, we could talk Discovery later, but I just think that a lot of these shows are trying so hard to be representative and relevant, and I think at the expense of good story or good character de- uh, development. And that oh, you mean like they're me. taking too many chances? You think? <laughs> I'm not, trying I'm to be trying to be pushy and risky and stuff like that. <laughs> no, I think I think uh, they 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 want to make sure that they are diverse. They want to make sure that uh, there are plenty of people of color and female leads and things like that. But then when it comes to the actual or and and they even write it into the story sometimes where the white guy's the bad guy. And it's just like okay, I mean, and I'm not I'm, I don't think of myself as an Archie Bunch, Bunker, but it's like. Man, this is pretty paper thin for a story, and um, like there even is an episode where some sort of virus breaks out and it makes all the men kind of cavemanny, and they're all like jerks and, and uh, sexually harassing and violent and rapey, and and it's like yeah, I get it, but it's like wow, you know, like all right, you know, I, I don't know, I and I, I I thought also the spins they did on uh, classic Serling uh, era stories. But they decided to rewrite them like, like Nightmare at uh, 20,000 Feet became Nightmare at 30,000 Feet. And it had 
Uh, yeah, I, I just it being a podcast just did not work. Yeah, yeah. It's just well, that's the thing. Like it's like all right, you know. Again, and they change it enough that it's like I, I don't know. I don't get it. What are you doing? Write your own, write original stories. It's okay. And also, don't forget that these things really do have to do with much like the code episode that you described about what's going on with the person, what's going on with the character that might manifest yep. itself in something science fiction or supernaturally. And I think. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, man. I, I don't know. How, and it was a big letdown because given how great Jordan Peele's doing from a film standpoint, um, yeah, I feel kind of let down by this new Twilight Zone. Well, I, know, I don't know anybody that's working on that show, but I will say this. I kind of wonder if Jordan Peele's, and I haven't read any interviews on this, interaction with this is that he's just the EP. Like he comes sure. in once a week, looks at the board, says yes no yes no walks away and just collects the paycheck kind of like what jj abrams does on like 12 different tv shows what greg berlanti does yep you know like he's not actually in the room of those 12 cw superhero shows he just comes in once or twice a week goes yep no yep no yep and then walks away i'm hip. you know so I, I i wonder how involved jordan peele was actually because if he was making us i gotta imagine that he wasn't involved at all Good Basically. point. Sure, because they're they were being produced concurrently. Absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. I, I you might be right, you know, or it might be like what uh, Serling had with Night Gallery, where he yeah, really man. was just the host, and you know, really Jack Laird was the actual like showrunner and everything, and uh, Serling objected to a lot of Night Gallery stories that they ended up doing. So Night Gallery is always a, a real hodgepodge, and unfortunately, it suffers from uh not taking care of the uh the masters or the negatives or whatever because it's one of the most washed out 70s shows it's it's not you know it's not in good shape isn't it like an impossible isn't that one of the shows that it's impossible to make it in hd because of that probably am i right or wrong about that i'm I'm guessing i've never actually directly heard that about that but i've certainly heard it about other shows and it wouldn't surprise me with with night gallery that that's the case uh me tv runs it at like you know three in the morning or whatever my time and uh, I catch it, but yeah, it's like oof. They're, they're why, are you, why are you up at three a.m., John? Are you okay? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> that's Tell my, the people. I, I I'm concerned. I'm well, one of the people. You know, don't you? Right? That's my. That's those are my usual radio hours when I'm doing traffic. Man, I'm Batman. I'm I'm uh, I'm on the ledge of the skyscraper. I guess I didn't realize you were doing traffic. I knew you were doing traffic early. I didn't realize it was that. Early. Oh yeah, man. Eleven <laughs> sometimes eleven at night till six in the morning. Ooh boy! Let me tell you. Let me tell you. So, although I've I've uh, I've been promoted on uh, most Saturday or Sundays to be uh, evenings, so so that's a little better. But yeah, it's uh, it's no, I've had my share since joining that I do I do a lot of overnight shifts. So if the traffic is ever wrong on Chicago, it's because you're you're getting mad at an episode of Night Gallery. Exactly, John. You missed an accident. I don't care. <laughs> I got a bitch about Rod Serling over here. Damn straight, man. Come on. <laughs> Gary Collins is uh, the ESPA uh, guy on all those Six Sense episodes that they folded into Night Gallery syndication. Give me a break. Good Lord. <laughs> but anyway, the, one of the main reasons why I wanted to have you on is you got a new book. It's coming out um, later this month in June, and it's uh, Super Soldiers. Yeah, June 18th, man, Super Soldiers. It's my um, first nonfiction novel. It's my first uh, book with only words and no pictures. Um <laughs> It's an idea I've had for a long time ago. Uh, or excuse me. It's an idea that I've had for a very long time because, you know, I, I've been in the comic book industry in like kind of aspects. I've been a writer. I've been like a pundit. I've been a host for a big comic book company. And at the same time, a lot of people don't know is that I'm also a veteran uh, right. of the army. So comic books in the military have like always been weirdly connected in my head. And so this was sort of the book that I thought I could write out and and show that connection to more people because they, there are a lot of connections between comic book storytelling and the military more so than people realize. Agreed. And certainly the birth of the comic book uh, really coincided with our involvement in World War II and um, also the trajectory of the superhero story um, was very important during World War II but, and, and changed in the post-war years. And I love... First of all, that's interesting because I saw it as a series of essays about each specific character that you're kind of taking a look at. And um, it's great because um, I recently saw Carl Reiner for the upteenth time doing an interview. And anytime that guy talks, I listen because he's such a Mm -hmm. brilliant writer. And he said when he created the Dick Van Dyke show, what ground do I stand on that other writers don't? 
And that was like, he's like, well, I live in New Rochelle. I, I was a television writer. I do X, Y, and Z. And that's really what he, you know, used as the basis for Dick Van Dyke. And it's great because you're using your love of comics and also your military experience. Comparing the two, how real uh, did some of the story tropes that are covered by these heroes, how real do they get? Um, what do they get right and what do they get wrong? And um, I, I think that's smart because, again, this is ground that you very individually stand on. Thanks, man. Yeah, like that's the other thing, too, is like going through these characters that so picked 16 different characters and figuring out like who actually has been used in their stories correctly and who hasn't. And and it kind of even surprised me like I, you know, like I think we all going into this. We're all like, you know, we we know those soldiers. We're like, we know Nick Fury. We know Deathstroke. We know Captain America and Captain Marvel and Sergeant Rock. And and I think out of that list and more, we would be like, OK, that one's going to be a good one. That one's going to be a bad one. That one. And and. Most of the time, they were wrong. Um, like weirdly, I it, it's interesting. I like some of my research I found with Captain America. Captain America really didn't become a real army soldier until recently. Interesting. And and before that, I kind of talk about this a little bit in my book. He's mm-hmm. sort of just a walking, talking American flag. He, he he's sort of the guy who just comes by and says like, "Buy your war bonds, Timmy," and and uh, loose lips sink ships. And and it's not really until I would say the eighties or forward that he actually becomes like a real person behind a soldier. Because again, uh, soldiers and superheroes kind of same. People want to paint them with the same brush. Like if you're a superhero, you act and think and do this. If you're a soldier, you act and think and do this. And that's kind of the way that Captain America is treated for most of the Silver Age. And when they start actually writing Steve Rogers as a real person, which is something that I think the MCU does very very well. That's when he becomes like a living, breathing, actually thinking soldier. I'm with you, and I and again, I uh, I think it is those contrasts that you point out that I think make this this book of I, I thought of it as a, a critical a, a collection of critical essays and and critiques. Oh, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And those books are great. Man. Those are wonderful, man. I, I I'm a huge fan of stuff like that where uh, a knowledgeable critic will really take a look at a body of work and say, this works, this doesn't work, or isn't it interesting that they made this choice? And uh, I wanna, I'll want to, i run through the 16. So you got Captain America. You've got um, yeah. the great character Gravedigger from uh, DC War Books, Men of War. Yeah, uh, our, our army at war, I think, is, is his. Very cool. And then, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, of course, Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel. Uh, War yeah. Machine. Green Lantern. War Jeff. Machine. Go ahead. I got to talk about War Machine, man. Sure. It's like... I, I, I had to put War Machine in this book because when I started reading comic books, Rhodey was Iron Man. Yeah. And and <laughs> it was like it was a period where like Tony was fake. He faked his death on a car crash, but he actually uploaded his brain to a computer. Yep. So the first Iron Man comic book I ever read was Rhodey had the classic like 90s armor on. It's before it, like the Iron Man armor had pants like where they put him in pants. It's the armor right before that one. <laughs> and when Tony Stark came back, as Iron Man, I was mad because I was like, Rhodey's Iron Man, what are you doing? Interesting. <laughs> wow. See, now I was, um, I mean, I started reading Iron Man in the 70s and was there for that first wave of Rhodey when Tony was too drunk to be Iron Man. And Rhodey took it over. Oh, and, and he was in the West Coast Avengers, Avengers as you point out. And that was a really mm-hmm. fun uh, period. And I always thought Rhodey was, was cool. Uh, and has only gotten cooler as they've evolved the character. But that's the great thing. Again, you you go hand in hand with what they give us from a military standpoint in the stories, and again, what they get right, what they get wrong. Carol uh, Danvers very interesting. I think the the Captain Marvel uh, chapter is is really really cool. But they're the, oh, thanks, you know, man. Yeah, yeah. I just want to yeah, I, I want to go th- I want to go through the list real fast. John Stewart. Oh, Cap- sorry, sorry. I that's can interrupt right. you. I just want to talk. I want to talk to you, man. Sorry. Well, no, no, no. It's all good. John Stewart, Captain Adam. Uh, John Stewart, Green Lantern, of course. Hal Jordan, Green Lantern. Flash Thompson, a great choice. Isaiah Bradley, and we'll talk about Isaiah Bradley, and Sergeant Rock. So that's the 16 that you specifically uh, get into. Oh, wait. And then uh, uh, I forgot a, yeah, a couple. Yep, because there's more. All good. Batwoman, uh, Beetle Bailey, which I love. I think that's hilarious. Nuke, The Punisher, Deathstroke, and Nick Fury. Yes. So there you go. There's your full 16. Um, and then a whole bunch of honorable mention people that I couldn't fit in. <laughs> absolutely. No, that's great, man. And it, and it is. It's. A, I think it's a, a fun book that I think people will enjoy. And, hey, man, if you're listening to Word Balloon, you like this kind of thinking. And you want to think about these characters and get into what makes them tick. And I think 
uh, Jason does that in his book, and I think is, uh, and, you know, you've always been, a, I think, a fair-minded pundit where, I mean, there, you know, there's stuff that we don't like. I mean, when we've talked about it here. Of course. But uh, but I, I think you're, again, I think you're fair-minded, and this really is an examination of just, you know, knowing what you know about the military, what they get right and what they get wrong, and it's interesting to point that stuff out, but... Uh, God, I'll tell you the the captain. It's so funny because really the two that really spoke to me the most were both the Steve Rogers chapter and the Isaiah Bradley chapter. Because man, truth, that thing, two thousand three. What a great book! And I, I just adored yes. it. I mean, I really did. Um, and damn it, I'm forgetting. Uh, was it Morales? Was it Robert Morales that wrote it? Because I know. Um, I, do, I you're you're right on it to Morales. Okay, uh, right. I it's. And he passed away young, which is a shame because he was a he was a really good writer, and um, and now I'm, and now I'm blanking on the other yeah, guy, it was the Ro- Robert Mor- Morales. You're okay. right, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So Robert well, Kyle Mor- Baker, man, Kyle Baker. Of course, it was Kyle Baker. Good lord, um, such a great book, and I and I had a chance to briefly uh, talk to Kyle uh, about it and everything, and I, I regret not getting a chance to talk to Robert about it. But it is such a smart, interesting idea that a Tuskegee airman sort of character and soldier would become Captain America and of course unfortunately face the same uh you know well and am I am I mixing up the Tuskegee experiment with the with the flyers well it's a little bit of both tell me you're all right like educated truth is based yeah truth is supposed to be like a basically a metaphor for the Tuskegee experiments because the idea is that they take Isaiah Bradley's unit and they experiment on them simply because of the color of their skin because they were the latrine unit at the beginning of that story yep. and then they get all infected and stuff like that um so no it, it's a little bit of both but they they do do some of the um uh, uh the other gentlemen you were talking about as well yeah it's uh geez i mean it's it's such a a, a great story and it really if you haven't read truth when you read because uh, i think jason really does capture the essence of the story i'm sure it'll make you go out and want to buy uh, that great graphic novel that Morales and Baker did. It's it it's re- great. And yeah. it's 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 one of those two that I don't think a lot of people remember now Agreed. like fifteen years later. Yeah. Or actually twenty years almost, almost twenty years later. Almost. Yeah. No, it was it Came was close, man. it was part of that um whole, you know, new marvel of Jemison and Casada and and when they were really, you know, kinda sticking their necks out there and then telling some controversial stories. And this was just amazing and so good. And I've loved uh, the subsequent appearances of guys like Josiah X, who was uh, Isaiah Bradley's grandson, who was part of yes. the Young Avengers and uh, things like that. No, it's a it's a great vein of Captain America that they it, it's it's a successful continuity implant because it certainly was never part of the original story. But Morales and Baker really came up with this great idea, and it's like, yeah, why not? It kind of in the same vein of the great uh, baseball players of the Negro Leagues that didn't get their chance uh, in the majors mm-hmm. and stuff, but still made such significant contributions to the game. And you can, and again, the Tuskegee Airmen, and of course the sadness of the Tuskegee Experiment. Well, and also originally when Morales and Baker were writing Truth, it originally was supposed to be out of continuity. And then apparently Joe Quesada liked it so much that he was like, no, 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 we're going to actually put this in continuity. That's cool. Which I think is a, is a testament of a, of, a, of a good, of a great editor. That's a, the sign that like – because again, like you can imagine like coming and pitching that story. They probably were like, yeah, OK. Yeah, this is an interesting Elseworlds. But when, sure. they, when they read it, <laughs> it, it's such a powerful story. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's so powerful. And I, I, and I dare anybody to read it um, – now and not be affected by it and and again even though um i don't have a lot you know because myself as a white man like i don't get to come at that with terms of going into the military discrimination like so my only angle in talking about my experiences with him was basically and this is something that a lot of people don't know is that when you join up with a service you are injected with every vaccine that ever exists and then if you go to a combat zone, they double down on the vaccines. Wow. Um, like I actually – fun fact, I, I'm vaccinated for anthrax. Wow. Because I got into that right before they were like, oh, we shouldn't give anybody anthrax. They, they, they decided – like it was around 2004 where they were like, we're not going to inject soldiers with any more anthrax. But I got it like right before – it was like a, two weeks before they, they did it. So like – so like again, like I bond with Isaiah 
and, and there's a lot of people I think in the service that would bond in that method of Isaiah. Of, there's certain points when you're in the military where it feels like the government's just doing whatever the hell they want with your body, and you just have to say like yes, sir, and move on. Wow, crazy, unbelievable, man. Yeah, yeah the more you know. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> so you know, let, let's talk about your military background. Uh, get, you know, give us give us the rundown. Um, so I joined the Kansas Army National Guard because, as you've heard my other episodes on here, I'm from Kansas, middle of nowhere, Kansas. I joined the Kansas Army National Guard. Uh, in the year 2000, um, about 10 months before 9-11. Wow. And I joined in high school. I joined when I was 17 because I, wow. I, I signed up the pitch, man. Like I was excited about the recruiter saying, hey, you're going to travel there. You're going to travel here. You're going to go all these places. And I was like, that's great, man, because all I've seen is southeast farmland Kansas. Sure. So I, I signed up. I got to see some really cool places. I got to see Germany. I got to see Ireland. I got to see a little bit of Canada. Um, And then in 2005, I got activated to the full-time army, and I participated for most of the year. I was there for about uh, 11 months and like three weeks of 2005. So I missed the last week of 2005, and I was part of our Operation Iraqi Freedom. Wow. And so I was there the whole year, and then – Six months after that is when I got out. So I did six years, and then I and then I and then I got out of there. But um, you know, there, I always say to everybody joining the military, you know, you have the people that are like, "How? What did you think about it? What did you? Was it fun?" And I say, "Well, mostly there are pros. Like, you know, I got a I got a great experience. I got to do things that many people won't do. But there's that one big con of ah, I had to spend a year in a war zone. Yeah, you know that yeah. kind of sucks. But um, you know, but that that's that's my that's my military experience, man. That's so I, I have a I have a little bit of all of it, I guess. <laughs> wow. And I mean, you know, you you were like you said, you were in a war zone. I mean, how close were you? Like, were you on the front? Were you? Were, what what were you doing in the war zone? Or what can you say that you were doing in the war zone? Well, mostly um, a lot of the missions that I did, and I, I assume a lot of servicemen did once they got to Iraq. Is I was a combat engineer in the army. Basically, what that means is when there's something in the road. We would take a block of C4, walk over there, plant the C4 on it, activate it, and blow it out of the way so we could keep on driving. Wow. But in Iraq, most of the time I was just on convoy security duty. So I was either in a gun truck with either a 50 cal, a 50 caliber gun, or an M4, which is a grenade launcher, at the front or the back or the middle of a giant civilian convoy, a bunch of semi-trucks driving um, supplies back and forth. And that was a lot of it. So um, I, I, I basically saw all of Iraq. Like I saw the border of Iran. Uh, I saw um, Fallujah. I saw wow. Baghdad, all over Baghdad. Because um, I was there the year of the first and the second elections. So that was towards the end of 2005. The first elections were an insane time. You know, everybody was going crazy. And there was a lot of improvised explosive devices. Yes, yes. And – then a month later, they found out that the first elections were corrupt, and they had to do them all over again. Man, so <laughs> I was I there for both of those, Jesus. which was a such, was such an interesting time. But um, I, I don't know. To, for me, I would say there really wasn't a front in Iraq. It's kind of everywhere. I mean, the explosive devices and the insurgents were just everywhere. So it was there really was no safe place. <sighs> the only safe place that you had in Iraq. When I was there, was if you were stationed in Kuwait. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Which is, you know, different country. <laughs> so. Right. Right. No, I understand. No, and I mean, I, so I guess the green zone really was kind of a misnomer of no, there really is no safe place. And you know, you well, that was one of go ahead. That was one of the few places, just because there were so many. I mean, that was one of those places where there are so many units and so many CIA officers and people like that 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 would have been the the stupidest place to attack in all of in all of Iraq. You know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I would say that there really was no safe place really in Iraq. Were you so- shoulder to shoulder with like the independent contractors? Cause we would always hear stateside obviously about, especially during, you know, the Bush years and, and, and the second Iraq war, uh, about how a lot of what, uh, in, in previous, uh, conflicts, what the army would handle, they would, they would kind of, you know, give to independent contractors. And it's always like. You know, and of course, you know, you, you hear about things like Blackwater and, and things like that. I, I'm, I'm always, you know, as, uh, really, this is the first time I've had a chance to talk to a veteran that was there um, and ask him about that. Yeah, here and there. I mean, we didn't go on missions with civilian contractors, but I actually 
had my tent right next to a bunch of civilian contractors. And there were Halliburton civilians all over our bases at every base I went to. Um, I, and I remember that specifically. I actually even talk about that in the book because in one of the characters I talk about a little bit in the War Machine chapter, I talk about how one of the most interesting things about Rhodey is that he went from combat. Like we met him in Vietnam. Right. And then he becomes basically a civilian. He becomes Tony Stark's pilot. Yes, right? that's exactly and, right. Yes. Yeah, and, and so I talk a little bit about my civilian transition, like when I came back, and one of the ideas that I kind of floated, and I specifically floated at this because there was a guy I met in Iraq, he was an employee of Halliburton, and he ran our fuel depot, where we would go to fuel up the Humvees and all the other vehicles. Sure. And I remember once going up to him, and his only job was to mark down like what unit we were for and how many gallons we took. We pumped the gas ourselves. Okay, yeah, yeah. So... I remember once asking him, like, oh, tell me about your job and how often you're here. And he was like, oh, you know, I'm I'm here three months on one month back in the United States and I do a two year tour. And then I said, oh, that doesn't sound too bad. Um, and he was like, yeah, they're always hiring former veterans. So he's like, if you want if you want to, you know, when you get out, if you want to come back, and make some sweet money. Let me know. I'll, I'll hook you up. And I said, oh, wow. What do you what do you make? How much do they pay? Because, you know, the armed forces notoriously pay diddly right <laughs> and this guy laughed out loud in my face and said i can't tell you it would break your heart uh these are the things that uh national public radio would cover in their documentary coverage <laughs> of the contractors and yeah that's the thing man and it was like man are we you know are we spending our money properly i mean it's it, it's like i don't know wouldn't it have made more sense i mean you know, my father was a uh, post World War II uh, occupation of Germany soldier, and he was uh, in mm -hmm. in Vienna after, in forty six. He was in training. I always say this, and it's funny. We obviously, as we're recording this, we just had uh, the Memorial Day weekend. Um, he was in training for the land invasion of Japan, much like D Day, uh, where if the bomb didn't work, that was the backup plan. And he was in California training for that. Obviously, the atomic bombs did work, and Jap Japan surrendered. So instead, he's like they they took him out of California, and instead he wound up in Vienna. And you know, back then this was in the post-war period, and, and the big German cities would be divided into the four Allied territories of the Russians, the French, the British, and the Americans. And he would point to a movie like uh, The Third Man, and he's like, "You want to know what uh, my army career was like? Watch that movie." And because he, he was, he, yeah. he was going after black marketeers and just dealing with helping people reconstruct, you know, this this country that was obviously just bombed into near oblivion. And so again, but you know, you know, you just always. And, it, and by the way, one of my favorite chapters that you have in there is uh, Beetle Bailey, and I'm really glad that you included oh, yeah. Beetle Bailey because yeah, man, I mean, that's you know, you do you kind of think of that civilian army or even just. Yeah, in the war, I peel a lot of potatoes doing KP and scrubbing toilets and crap like that and stuff. And it's like the contractors, you know, there was always the conspiratorial theory of, are these guys, you know, I mean, are, are they going out in secret emissions? And how many of those are they going out to? But also, like, your your guy pump, you know, just running the gas depot, not even pumping the gas, and probably making six figures doing it. Oh, easily, easily he was making six figures. But yeah, man, I had to include Beetle Bailey on this because I think when everybody <laughs> – if you even more so than I think in Captain America, I think when you think military and comics, you think Beetle Bay. Totally. And and to be honest with you, um, I think we would all we're all in the military more like Beetle Bailey than we want to admit. <laughs> we're, we all we all we all act like Beetle Bailey. Like at the end of the day, there there, there are some days where you're just, where you just want to say screw off, Sarge. You know, <laughs> I'm gonna go take a nap by the tree, man. <laughs> that that strip, I love that strip, and I'm so I'm kicking myself still that I missed the opportunity of seeing Mort Walker at one of the New York cons before he passed away. Oh wow! Yeah, he had a panel, and that would have been amazing. Oh dude. my god, I can only imagine. And I love um, the book Cartoon Country County that talks about that uh, county in uh, New England where a lot of the comic strip people and some comic book people as well lived. Uh, like Stanford, Connecticut, or whatever, and they would commute to New York and drop off their artwork and stuff. And um, Mort Walker was one of those guys. And it's uh, it's written by Cullen Murphy, uh, the son of John Cullen Murphy, who did... Uh, he was the second artist uh, on uh, Prince Valiant after Hal Foster retired, 
but in the 40s and 50s, he had a great comic, adventure comic strip that I loved called Big Ben Bolt, where it was about a boxer. And But it was like more serious. That's awesome. Yeah, it was serious adventure as opposed to Joe Palooka, which was more of a comedy thing. But uh, yeah. but yeah, no, Mort Walker and Beetle, Beetle Bailey's fantastic. And of course, uh, I'm enjoying uh, the new Spencer and Locke volume that uh, has its own little twist on uh, on Beetle Bailey. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. good yeah. stuff, man. No, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you included Beetle. Because I, I, I'm, oh, I'm a of huge course, fan. man. Uh, yeah, like I love Beetle Bailey, and I think he doesn't get enough credit. And and I love too the sort of comic book legacy that his, um, I think it's his granddaughter and his grandson or his grandson that Mort Walker's um, uh, uh, grandson or son are continuing the strip now. Oh, I didn't realize after that. his death. Oh wow! Yeah, it's it, yeah, it's Mike. It's 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 like um, it's it's Danny Walker. It's his, it's his it's his daughter that is continuing the strip. That's very cool. Oh my god! Mm-hmm. No, I'm a huge I'm a huge fan, man. And I loved how he would uh, he would always put navels on uh, Miss Buxley and the various women when he'd have them in bikinis and stuff. And the censors would make him cut them out. And he had like a box of like uh, exacto knife uh, cut out navels, you know. And he would just perp- you know, or he would he would have a crate of navel oranges, and they'd have women in bikinis on the on the on the box of navel oranges and stuff, just to kind of <laughs> thumb his nose at the at the censors. No, I love that stuff, man. Captain Adam, a great uh, military story that I think only became more interesting and complex after his uh, quality run uh, and Charlton runs uh, when uh, they. I don't, actually, I don't think he was part of quality. I think it was just Charlton, and then of course, uh, yeah. when uh, when Len Wein took him over at DC. I thought it became uh, an interesting kind of military conspiracy. You know, it's a it's a superhero that the military is behind covertly in some ways, and and it would obviously cross the line in terms of what Captain Adam could or couldn't do, because ultimately he did have to uh, answer to superiors. But that that's a that's a, one of the great things about writing this book is um, I was not a Captain Adam fan before this book. I kind of just thought he was military Superman with silver skin. And then when I read that run and I read like I I had to read, I read so many comic books about all these characters, but the Captain Adam one like really stuck out to me. And now I'm a huge Captain Adam fan. And now to be honest with you, like fingers crossed, I would love to write a Captain Adam run because the, the most interesting thing about him is this idea of lost time. And a lot of people want to put that on Captain America, right? The idea that, like, oh, he was frozen in time and life went out. You know, he he missed his best girl. But interestingly enough, I think that Captain Adam run covers that more. That this guy's life was stolen away from him. And that when he woke up, his wife and his daughter were – he had basically been replaced by the general that put him in the experiment. Yeah. And that's something that I that I really empathize with because um, – and I, and I talk about this a little bit in the book as well – that the idea that – Every soldier or service member that's deployed, you feel like your life has been put on pause and that the rest of the world's going on. And it, it is and it's an actual fear. I had this fear that I was worried about coming back because I um, I went to Iraq in between my college years. Wow. So I went I went to like fresh I, I went to freshman and sophomore year. Then I got deployed. And then I came back and did junior and senior year of my college. Wow. And I was worried about coming back to college because I was like, oh, man, like I won't have the same classmates and and I haven't done homework in a while. Can I still do homework? I don't know if I want it. Like I, I was sure. having these thoughts of like, oh, maybe I don't even want to sit in class anymore. Maybe I'll think the teachers are stupid because in my head I'll be like, I've seen war, son. What have you seen? Uh, <laughs> I understand. You know, totally. Stuff like that. Wow. Um, but but that that but like when I read that Captain Adam series, man, like that it was it's so so good, and I I think it's completely out of print too. Um, I had a hell of a time tracking it down. I bet, um, man. And, I, and shame on me, by the way. It's Carrie Bates who. Yeah, I think is the forgotten great writer of the seventies and eighties of DC. Because I'd agree with that. Because yeah, and you know, his flash was incredible. And I know that was one of the immediate things that Jeff Johns and I bonded over was loving Carrie Bates's flash epic and, and his incredible run. And then I don't know if we've talked about it before, but um he was gonna do uh, an Else Worlds I think it was either I think it was either going to be a prestige format or a full graphic novel. I think it was going to be a prestige format series that they ended up just putting in regular uh, paper, and they made it an mm-hmm. Elseworlds miniseries. And it was a great Superman story of what if Jor-El was able to save himself and Lara and Cal, 
and they all came to Earth together and then had a life of several decades and what happened to them and even having a daughter on Earth, the two of them. And it, it's this fantastic Superman Elseworlds story. And Is that the last family of Krypton? Probably. Probably. Okay, I'm, I was, I've been furiously Googling while you've been talking because I was like, I want to read this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Dude, I swear it is so worth reading. And he – man, he just – that the 70s Superman always gets maligned for um, – because it had remnants of the more Weisinger goofiness occasionally. You had guys like yeah. – you know, Captain Strong was clearly Popeye and some of the crazy – or Johnny Nevada was Johnny Carson, which is hilarious. You know, mm-hmm. goofy stuff. And certainly Steve Lombard just – Picking on Clark and everything. I love Steve Lombard, I man. Too, man. I don't know why people don't. I really like. I mean, to me, Steve Lombard is the opposite to Lois Lane. Like Lois, as as much as Lois Lane is like this perfect representation of a smart, capable, beautiful, badass woman. I think Steve Lombard is like the opposite negative reaction of that. Yes. Like he's this the 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 crappiest Lothario who's a dunce. Yes. Well, he was a dunce. He was. It's so funny because Howard Cosell in the 80s would complain about what he called the jockocracy and how former athletes were taking over broadcasting. And Lombard was this former Metropolis quarterback who became yeah. a sports writer. And yeah, dumb as a rock, jerk, total, like, you know, yeah, thought he was the, you know, God's gift to women and was just a total ass to, uh, to Clark. And the great thing was every now and then, like they had that great story, Clark Kent forever, Superman never, where Clark finally he thought he was losing his powers, so he finally dropped the uh, the the wimp uh, thing, and even stood up to Steve a couple times and everything, and it was fantastic. And he didn't like hurt him because he was losing his powers, so he was only human strong. But it was great, and and Bates knew how to write the Daily Planet cast, and always had interesting little stories yes. going on. And Marty Pasco was part of that group, and Elliot Magan, and it seems like uh, Elliot and Marty. Are uh, are usually more remembered than Carrie is, and again, I think Carrie very quietly, I, I like you know he came back for that uh, Captain Adam story uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, yeah. and a couple other things here and there, and he also did a Marvel thing, and I can't remember. And uh, shame on me, man! I gotta uh, I gotta talk to my uh, usual Silver Age and Bronze Age connections and uh, track Carrie down because he is such a great writer, and I, I'm such a fan yeah. of his stuff. So. You should. Uh, he's yeah. He's one of the unsung heroes, I think, of DC Comics. Totally, man. No, I agree. And uh, well, you know, like I said, we mentioned that uh, you you cover Carol and uh, and Captain mm-hmm. Marvel, and I think that's timely. And then certainly, uh, what Kelly Sue did with the character is a lot of fun. And I like the contrast of Carol's life as a test pilot and Hal Jordan's uh, life as a test pilot. Yeah, they they both become test pilots for completely different reasons, and it, and a little bit of it's both ego, but it's d- ego for different things. Like Carol's constantly trying to uh, prove herself to her father because her father says that she can't do it, so that's the reason why she does it. Whereas Hal is just the opposite. Hal is doing it because of his father, because Hal is trying to prove himself as good as his father, and it's something that, like I said, I, I stumbled upon that it's interesting when you look at Hal. Hal is just this little boy that's trying to desperately sink his father's approval, but he'll never get it because his father's dead. Yep. Whereas Carol, she has one of these moments where like the dad, her dad dies and she's like, good. Like I beat you. <laughs> like, yeah. like, whoa, yeah. easy. Oh yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. And, and really I, I gotta say, cause I'm, I'm normally against the idea of the civilians becoming heroes. And uh, this isn't about Carol, but about flash Thompson. I really think that sometimes, one you know, because sometimes it's like, you know, Batman has a great cast of characters, Superman has a great cast of characters, Spider-Man does. But you get beyond that, and it's like a lot of the heroes don't. And it's like, well, yeah, because a lot of times a person will start off as a, as a civilian in a book and then adopt a, a masked, you know, identity. And at first I'm mm-hmm. like, I don't know if I want Flash to be Venom. But God, uh, dealing with his own post uh you know uh, combat uh, si- you know situations it really was this very interesting idea uh making uh, flash venom and i thought it was a a, a really uh, interesting run while it lasted yeah that that's that's really great and there there's this amazing oh god i think it's like amazing spider-man i think like 573 or 572 it's by mark guggenheim and it's where it tells you the story about how Flash lost his legs in Iraq. Yeah. 
and it's uh, they consulted like a real um, Iraqi army veteran. If you like are interested, if you are like, man, how does the military get represented in the comic books? That's the one issue I would tell you all to seek out because it was published less than ten years ago. It was part of Brand New Day. That's right. But it, it was such an interesting change to one of Spider-Man's supporting cast, and that's something too. Like I love superhero supporting cast, and I and I think not enough superheroes do have that. That it is such a Silver Age, Golden Age thing, man. Yep. But I love. I love those weird. I love Bibbo Babowski. Sure. <laughs> I um I I I love Betty Brant. Yes. I, I really do. Um, I love all those. I, I love Harold and Batman. Like sure. the, the weird, uh, um, extra <laughs> fix it guy that Batman has that lives in the second cave underneath the Batcave. Right. It's never never quite clear. That's right. Um, During no man's land I, and everything. I, yes. Yes. During the nineties. Yeah, dude. I I love the, I love all those characters. So like anytime comic books expand <laughs> out there, but. But adding like that little layer to Flash and making him a veteran and making him Agent Venom was such a genius idea because that was at the height of the war on terror, right? So we have 300,000 people in Iraq. We have like 200,000 people in Afghanistan, like 500,000 people being currently actively deployed in combat zones. That was a time in the mid-2000s, and that's when they did this, where you probably could have asked everyone in America, everyone in America, hey, do you know somebody that's deployed? And somebody would either have a friend or a, a family member like th- two or three steps removed that was the p- currently deployed. Yeah. That's how many people were, were overseas at the time. Yeah. It was insane. Agreed. And also, um, you know, going back to the Silver Age when uh, Flash was serving during the Vietnam era, one of my favorite little like scenes, it was in a Shocker uh, Spider-Man story, and it's in Origins of Marvel Comics. Um, they they tell the origin and then they tell a, diff- a, a second story, and it's a great scene with Peter, Gwen, and Flash. And um, I forget what triggers Peter, but he just starts like just complaining about Flash, and he's just tired of Flash's shit. And he's just like, you know, back off, Flash. You know, I, I I'm not in the mood for your BS or whatever. And uh, Flash wasn't like he misread what Flash was trying to do. He's like, hey, whatever, Parker, and he walks away. And Gwen Stacy's like, Peter Parker, how dare you? She's like, that guy is overseas protecting us and, you know, putting his ass on the line. What have you ever done? And walks away. And it's like, but I'm, I'm, all right. And it's great because it was this great little ironic scene that, that Stan came, I think Stan wrote it. Because um, I do think it was still uh, when Stan was writing Spider-Man. Um, it, mm-hmm. it was, and that's, you know, it's. Yeah, that moment's also like really heavily homaged in um, Chip Zdarsky's uh, Spider-Man Life Story, yes. which, uh, which is out right Isn't now. Isn't that great? And it's great. <laughs> it's so good, man. Oh, I know. So good. I just and I told him like Chip, the last thing I wanted to do was buy a five dollar a month Spider-Man comic, but God damn it, you and uh, you and Bagley once again. Uh, I mean, yeah, it, I'm, it's so I'm, good. I'm so jazzed to own the hardcover of that. I bet, man. <laughs> I bet that's fantastic. No, it's it really is great, and. Uh, and that's great. I'm I'm really happy for Chip. Chip's kicking ass over in Marvel. It's so yeah, funny. Yeah, man, he's great. Yeah, he's doing great. I'm happy for J- uh, Jerry Duggan. Uh, all these guys are, I think, you know, succeeding over at Marvel. And I, re- you know, Ed Ed Brisson is another uh, guy that I'm happy for. Uh, you know, cool stuff. Dennis Hopeless. I mean, these guys that I've seen, you know, when they were banging their head against the wall trying to make image books and stuff, and then, you know, they're get they're getting their shots. So it's a uh, it's an interesting time. I uh, are you enjoying uh, uh, Bendis's uh, Superman stuff? I like action more than Superman. I do too, actually. I I am liking action a lot more. I, I guess because action is is the Daily Planet book that we all yeah. want. We, we, we've been screaming for years <laughs> that we want. <laughs> Yes. And I feel like DC finally listened or that that Brian like tricked DC into being like, this is actually going to be a Daily Planet book, but I'm not going to tell anybody. Um, and I'm like, good on you, Brian. <laughs> good on you. I totally agree. And I'm so I haven't read it yet. <laughs> you know, we're, we're talking on new comic book day. I haven't read the Leviathan Rising uh, 80 page special, but I'm very excited for Rucka doing uh, Lois. And I'm very excited about Fraction doing Jimmy Olsen. The Jimmy Olsen scene when he's. When he's in uh, Cobra in a Cobra meeting with on a date, and it's like, oh shit, oh, <laughs> I'm in yeah. a cult meeting. <laughs> I, I haven't I haven't had a chance to to read Leviathan Rises yet either, but I will say uh, um, I got a chance. Uh, Steve Lieber uh, snuck me a peek at Jimmy Olsen issue one at Emerald City Comic Con. Awesome, and it's it's great. 
it's it's a lot of fun. That's and, it, and, it, and it really feels like those old classic Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen issues. As it should. Well, that's a great thing. I mean, you you want Jimmy running, although again, and I and I'm wondering if you how much you've ever read of that stuff. As much as I love the goofy, great Silver, silver Age stuff of Jimmy, I like '70s Superman Family Jimmy, Mister Action, because it let him grow. Uh, you it know, let him grow up a yeah. bit, and he was an investor. He was what we want from Lois as well in terms of no, let's get the adventures of Daily Planet, Planet investigative reporter. There's like good ideas in there, and you don't need a cape to solve the problem necessarily. And they let Jimmy do that, and I thought that was and, he, and again he's a little bit older, and it was it was good. It was nice to see like that was like Jimmy's version of Nightwing, basically those years. Yeah, you know I like both. Sure, I like the weird Turtle Boy Jimmy oh, yeah. stuff too, and Bug Boy, and like. <laughs> but I also I love him as Mister Action. It's funny. I actually thought Grant Morrison and All Star Superman had a great take of like combining both of them. That Jimmy was like the most zaniest and dangerous person in Metropolis, <laughs> yet he was still goofy. Because I love that like Grant Morrison had Jimmy do this epic adventure and that issue he has him save Superman, and then at the very end, his his last two demands because he still has the twenty four hours with the giant super scientist on the moon. His two main demands are. Carve a message that, uh, that says "I love you" to my girlfriend in the moon, and then I want one of his jackets. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, and you're like, "That's that. totally Jimmy Olsen." That's right? fantastic, absolutely, man. That's so funny, and I loved in the Silver Age when uh, Jimmy and uh, Robin, the Olsen Robin team, and they had their own um, the Eerie or the Airy, however it's called, where it was like the Bird Secret Headquarters. And, I think it was the Airy. Yeah, it probably was the Airy. Oh, I love that. I mean, I, again, I you know they were. As as much as people younger than me fell in love with the Teen Titans and the idea of them, you know, getting older and stuff, yeah, this was this was my jam and the Super Sons. I'll even cop to the Super Sons. Yeah, those were fun stories when I was yeah, young. Yeah. Too damn funny, man. Well, Super Soldiers is a great <laughs> book of essays, and I, I uh, absolutely Thanks, uh, no, honestly, my pleasure to help you uh, get the word out on this. Are you going to do any specific Super Soldier panels at any cons? Uh, no, I don't have any plans for anything right now. So if any cons are listening, I'd love to, I'm trying to get a signing in LA probably at the end of June, um, and try to, trying to rope in a friend of mine who's also a veteran to like do like a Q and a kind of thing event in LA. And we'll see if that's going to happen or that'd be great. That'd be, all that'd be great. And I wish I could point you to the organizers in San Diego that handle, um, the academic panels. And I don't know how, how I don't know how much you've like dipped into those when you go to San Diego. Because you were always... I've been to a couple. All right, good. Because, yeah, man, I mean, really, and for for the listeners who don't know, occasionally I'll have on, like, a you know, a Nikki Wheeler or a Nicholson or, or, you know, a historian that, that gets into the history of comics. And sometimes they're the most fascinating stories. There was one I saw where it was all about uh, a comic strip that was published in Japan, in post-World War II Japan, that was, that was created to help normalize... Um, Japanese and American relations and it was this like kind of humor mag, you know humor strip and it was the history of this strip and it was fascinating or a guy was talking about uh, one of the great uh, black comic creators of the golden age Matt Baker and he had written this very detailed biography of Matt Baker and he spoke and I just feel like um, really super soldiers I think would fit into that even though you're you're not coming uh, from an academic point of view but it is I, I do think it's that kind of panel that I think would be incredibly interesting. So, if, oh, thanks, man. Oh, yeah. No, my, my my good friend uh, Josh Elder, sure, who used to write, uh, yeah, scribble knots stuff like that. He does a lot of panels as, as in that ter- type of realm yes. in San Diego Comic Con, especially like around like libraries and how libraries affect comic books and how comic books can be used to teach. And like, yeah, it's it, I know I notice a lot of people don't go to them because they're like on the far far end. They're they're like right around the curve around Hall H and stuff like yeah. that. And I, I get a lot of people don't want to walk that far, but like, there's a lot of like really weird and yet very interesting, cool panels in the little side closets of San Diego Comic Con. Totally, so Rob Rob Salkowitz and I would run into each other in these kind of panels, and it's like you're right. I mean, literally, it would be maybe two or three dozen like audience members watching these people, but they were always really interesting, and a lot of times they were uh, univer- in, in uh, unlike the case of Josh, who was you know doing the. Uh, uh, Reading with Pictures is his great charity that works with libraries and stuff. This stuff really was like just cherry-picking interesting little things about comic strip and comic book history 
that they're writing for their, you know, uh, their professors. They're writing them for their 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 papers. And I mean, that's where uh, Ten Cent Archie, for example, was a great book that I know I saw there and then later bought. Mm-hmm. And it really just focused on the era when Archie comics were ten cents. So it was all about Archie in the uh, specifically in the fifties and sixties. And I thought it was really interesting. And it talked about all the different social changes that were reflected in Archie and everything. And it was like, this is really interesting. So, And that's why I think your kind of book as well would, would, would dovetail into that kind of milieu. of. Uh, of uh, oh, thanks, Dave. Absolutely, man. No, I think it's a thoughtful critique. Well, I, ha- I have to ask you because you're, you're, I'm still in this world where less than 10 people have actually read it. <laughs> you know, besides, besides my wife. You're one of the 10. Okay. So... Um, it's again. It's it's interesting to hear because again, like it doesn't come out for until June 18th. Sure, so sure. it's one of these ideas oh, where mind. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, wow, you read this. Somebody actually read it besides me. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, honestly, and and everyone's gonna go, oh please, get over yourself. But if you liked, um, was it Super Gods, Grant Morrison's book? Yeah, honestly, that's, a great book. that's I own it. well, that's another book that I would say uh, because this is your point of view on these heroes. What they did with them, what they did, what you feel they did right and wrong, and, and how well this is how the real military works, and it's a great exploration in these characters. There was also a great book of uh, Batman essays, and I think it was called like you know Sixteen Miles from to Gotham City, that great sign that we always saw when uh, the Batman mm-hmm. was leaving the Batcave in the Bat in the sixty six Batman series, and it's just a bunch of essays about you know what various writers thought of Batman, and I remember Chuck Dixon wrote a great piece about growing up and being a, a school age kid when uh, Batman 66 was airing and how, you know, every cliffhanger was the next day's subject at school. How's Robin getting get, mm-hmm. get out of the giant clam? You know, Robin's dead! That's really cool. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. Oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's nice. I, I, I love that you compared my my book to, to something that Grant Morrison wrote. I, uh, <laughs> uh, hi, Grant. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, that's awesome. I don't think I'm nearly that good, but that's awesome. Um, I, I will say this, and I have to give like a, a shout out to this because uh, my amazing wife, uh, Ashley Victoria Robinson. This, um, it, it is like each chapter is its own like little essay about these characters, um, and that's all it was going to be at first. And it's funny, I was writing the Captain America chapter. I had a really, really hard time with it because again, I discovered that Captain America is a walking, talking American flag for <laughs> most of his history, and that's hard to write about. And my wife, Ashley Victoria Robinson, suggested to me that I should interject my personal army stories in it absolutely and as soon as i did that like the book sort of came together so it like it became this weird sort of personal autobiography about my times in the military and ashley was the first person to ever read this book and she said that she learned a lot of stuff about me that that i'd never told her which i guess i didn't realize but you know most of this stuff isn't you know common dinner conversation sure. so um i hope other people find it as fascinating as well, and uh, I hope if other companies out there find it as fascinating that they would uh, email me for my pitch on the Punisher. Hello. Oh, <laughs> nice. Do you want to do uh, an essay book or a, uh, a real look at the Punisher and obviously his uh, his military background? Go a little further than you do in the book. I want to. I want. Yeah, I want an actual um, because or I don't. I couldn't. I actually. <laughs> I want to write the Punisher, my friend, and 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 Matthew Rosenberg is doing an amazing sure job. Is. So I don't want to, <laughs> I do not want to uh, take a job away from him. I'm just saying, in the future, sometime oh, maybe as a KFC direct a KFC comic, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, in the bucket of chicken you pull out, and there's a Punisher. Hey, cool! Sure. He killed these chickens. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> no, I actually, ones, yeah. <laughs> I have an interesting idea for the Punisher that I don't, I don't think many people have considered because. Um, and I try. And I would love to pick your brain on this. I I tried to research this. I could not find the answer. I don't know if a Marine or any kind of veteran has actually written the Punisher. I was going to ask you that same question. I can't think I of anyone either. I couldn't find the answer. I I looked for it because I wanted to put it in the book. Because I figured I figured of all of the characters in here. Because everybody knows, of course, like Jack Kirby and uh, served, and so he worked on Captain America. So that. But I could not find a writer for the Punisher. I I, I, I was trying to figure out if Larry Hama had ever Ooh, written the Punisher, and I don't think he has. That is, or, a, or did he? Yeah, I'm, that I am not sure of. And I was trying to think if Mike Barron was a veteran or anything. Um, yeah, I know. I know Chuck wasn't. Dixon. Um, 
Yes. You know, and I know Garth Ennis wasn't, right. and uh, Jason wasn't. I don't think it. Jason. Yeah, Jason has think... his uh, uncle. That uh, wasn't it Jason's uncle that wrote uh, full me- the original Full Metal Jacket novel. Jason. Oh, Aaron. I'm not certain about I, that. That's amazing. I, wow. I thought so. Good for him. I thought because wow. like you know the other side. Have you read uh, Jason's book, The Other Side? That was like one of his first non superhero. Yes. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm reasonably certain. I, again, you know, uh, 800 episodes later, I, I might be wrong about that without re-listening to my initial interviews with Jason. But yeah, I, I do know that uh, Jason definitely had some military people in, in his uh, family um, that he leaned on for various things. But yeah, I don't think I don't know. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah, just so that's something that's something curious. You sure. know, I, I I would be interested to see. Marvel give that to, and I'm not. It doesn't even have to be be me. Is what I'm saying. I I would love to to, to read an actual veteran's take on the Punisher. Totally, I think it would be very interesting. I uh, I'm so. I'm a, I'm excited to see how far they delve into Batwoman's history on the CW show, and show her military background and also her father's military background. I'm very excited about that too because Duggery Scott plays her father. Yes, I love him, and he's a. He's a great actor. Although I will, I, I, I tweeted about this, and I'm going to give uh, CW Batwoman crap because, um, and I and I have a friend that works in Batwoman, so uh, I say this with the, with love because I am excited for that show. There's a scene in the trailer where it looks like it is during Kate's basic training, and her drill instructor is wearing no rank on his military uniform, and his uh, uniform is buttoned up wrong, and. <laughs> It drove me mad. <laughs> Do they, um, you know, here's another military character that you touch upon, and it's one of your uh, postscript acknowledgments and everything. Steve Trevor, I mean, you know, um, his current role in Argus, and it's, you know, I guess really I'll, I'll have to delve a little more into whatever uh, Brian has planned with Leviathan and everything. But, I mean, how military does Argus get? Because Argus really seems more a secret spy organization than... Uh, slightly paramilitary, but not 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 quite. I, I don't know. Well, there were some there were some times during Trinity War that that New Fifty Two crossover yeah. where Steve kind of came off as like he was on a SWAT team or a SEAL team. Um, it, it, it's really weird. I think it's up to the whims of the writer. Sure, because it is kind of a James Bondian you know organization, but they do have Steve sort of you know, saddle up, lock and load and put on a, a flak vest and go out for battle. So I, I think it just depends on what they want Steve Trevor to do. Okay. Um, but he is kind of, the, he is the, that's the reason why I didn't include him in as one of the main chapters is because he, that kind of is his character. Like, I mean, he, he has been in the army. He's been in the air force. He's been a Navy seal. He's been a secret agent. Like they can't quite decide where they want to have him land. And they keep changing their, their mind about which, like part of the service they want him to be a part of. I've always liked him, and I, I loved what uh, they did with Chris Pine in the first movie, and I'm looking forward to seeing the Wonder Woman 84 movie and then seeing how uh, how they work all that out. Hell, I even liked Lyle Wagner in the <laughs> in the Linda Carter no. show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Steve Trevor is like one of the best parts. Uh, I I have a weird, and again, this is a I have a weird prediction for Wonder Woman 1984. I think he's the villain. That's hilarious. That'd be fantastic if that's the idea. Yeah. Or I, yeah, I think it, I think they're gonna do. My weird prediction for that movie is that they're gonna do just what they did with uh, Sir Patrick. That you're gonna see Chris Pine like throughout that movie, and she's gonna be so excited, you know, because it's her one true love. And then at the end of the movie, he's gonna like change his face, and he's Phobos, the god of fear, or something like that. <laughs> so. All right, that's a good transition, as you mentioned, Sir Patrick and everything. We got to uh, we 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 got to talk a little Star Trek, man. Dis- yeah, dude, I miss. Did you guys continue to review Discovery after the first season? You and Ash, we did not because we decided to um, just you know rip off the band aid. I think a little bit. Um, <laughs> if, if you've if you've seen my Twitter, you know I was not a big fan of Discovery season one. Yeah. Um, Neither was I. So I, I, yeah, yeah, we talked oh, about yeah, this before. I, oh man, I, I just wanted to enjoy season two as a viewer. Yeah, I wanted to like not think about reviewing it and try to see if I could enjoy it more. And I didn't enjoy it much more. <laughs> I, I will say that. I, I uh, I'll be <laughs> honest. I got angrier at it because, uh, I mean, I, I thought Anson Mount did great. I thought he was terrific. He's great. And and I think thankfully it's interesting because. 
you don't know how much of this is rumor, and you don't know how, how much of this is true. But it, you know, the the rumors are that the producers didn't like what he did. Uh, that you know he had conflicts with them. They didn't think he was giving them that much, and uh, weren't happy with the rushes. And again, I just thought he was the most Star Trekian character on that show. And um, God damn, man, I just what they did with Sarek, what they did with Spock. I'm shaking my head right now. It was just so dumb. And again, this bridge crew that you still, I, I, I'm still not sure of all their names. And um, I understand they wanted to make a show where the the focus was on on a, one character as opposed to being an ensemble piece. But it, you just they had all these empty scenes of oh I'm supposed to feel bad because this entire crew is about to uh, you know go off and, and as things were resolved in the in the second season and saying goodbye to their families and it's like I don't know these people I don't care it doesn't matter yeah. it's meaningless and um, you know I I, uh, I I don't know I mean again I just I thought it, it got dumber and I and I really think at the end and also. For Michelle Yeoh's character to come from season one to season two, um, that's ridiculous. Because she is she is kind of space Hitler, as some of the more harsher critics have called her character. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, she's a cannibal, and she had no problem killing, and yet, hey, Starfleet, I think we have a job for you. And it's like, what? Get out of here. What are you talking about? Good Lord. And it, I just didn't believe yeah, her character. Know, yeah. I really didn't believe it. I actually I liked her in the season just because I thought she was so she was such a good actor. It, it's funny everything you're describing and is all the problems we have with Discovery are when you logistically like think through things. Like when you're thinking about Discovery season two and the fact that like everybody in Starfleet knows what Section Thirty One yes. is and they're okay with this clandestine secret organization that murders people left and right even though like we get told every episode that starfleet is like good and and pure and the best of the best you know you're like wait what why are you working with those people why would you be okay with those people why is benjamin cisco like so mad about those people 150 years later um the stuff we like about discovery is the surfacey stuff it's like pike and the special effects and the look of stuff like we like that stuff but like when you dig into it like my biggest problem with the the finale and 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 spoilers of course everybody if you have not seen the finale um, when they make the decision to uh, I'm going to reveal it's it right. if you if no, you haven't do watched, it. it's I'm just telling the listeners yeah, yeah. I want to make sure I don't want I don't want anybody to tweet no, me and be like good, what man. you do you're a good man I respect right. that when 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 they fly into the space portal to go a thousand years into the future um they do that because they're trying to get rid of control the ai virus that is like taking over section 31 and attacking the universe for for reasons we because yes because so go on yeah michelle yo defeats it before they go through the portal but yet they They still still go go. through the portal Yeah. yeah they still go all these people have families fathers mothers and they're all like no we're still gonna go a thousand years into the future because and you're like no like, come on, it's, stop the shit. Well, and again, the ridiculous notion that, well, you know, hey, don't worry. By the end of the second season, this will all make sense from a continuity standpoint. Wrong. And again, how about all those families? It's one thing to tell all the Starfleet officers, okay, we're never going to speak of Discovery again. It's totally classified and uh, whatever. But what happens to all these families? I mean, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just like... Yeah, all these... Yeah, especially when the episode before that episode, we had like a five minute sequence, which I actually was one of my favorite sequences of all of Discovery, where we saw all the crew members calling their families and saying goodbye. Yes. Um, I actually thought that sequence was so good. And I wish more of the show was like that. So for me, I was like, well, we know these people have families out there and we'll miss them. But why are you volunteering to go to the future for no reason? <laughs> well, and again, it w- that's, those scenes would have had more resonance for me if we knew the characters better. Just like, and I don't remember her name, but we'll refer to her as Robot Girl, because that's always been the short uh, Ariel. I re- Arium or Ariel? Congratulations. Be- One of the two. Because literally, yep. um, other than her flashing red eyes throughout season two, and the one episode where she dies, um, and you get that flashback of her before she had her cyborg parts, um, you knew nothing about her other than she's a crew member. She dies, 
And then the following episode, her funeral is longer than Spock's funeral in Wrath of Khan. And it's like, yes. we don't know this person. I'm sure all these people are affected, but you gave us no opportunity to know these people. And it's just, that drove me nuts. I know we talked about it in the first season when Ash Tyler is revealed to be a Klingon. And it's like, yeah, you killed Dr. Culver, but we'll still be your friend. We'll eat lunch with you. And it was, like I said, that was yeah, Star that, Trek Degrassi. Degra- that's a little weird as well. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's just like, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe the motivations of these characters. And, or, or again, going back to Ariel, um, so she has all these cybernetic parts. There's one scene, and it's just a crowd scene in the ship, and in the distance you see a crew member in a wheelchair, wheel by. And I'm like, well, all right, wait a minute. I And it, to me, smacked of, hey, disabled people, uh, we're, we're, you know, don't worry. We haven't forgotten you. You're represented on this show. But it's like, well, they've got cybernetic parts, so if there really was somebody that, that truly you know, couldn't use their legs anymore, wouldn't they have, like, made robot legs for her, cybernetic legs? I I just, I I felt that was, again, I felt it was gratuitous, and I think a lot of what they tried to do to show they were a woke show and representative, I thought was very gratuitous and had no depth to it. And it, it frankly, uh, insulted me because it's like, well, you just don't get it. And it's like, well, I don't know, man. Star Trek's always been inclusive and representational, um, without hitting our heads, or, you know, hitting us over the head with it, and having deeper characters beyond I, I, just being a woman or or a person of color or whatever. Yeah, I think I think the thing you're chiving against is, and again, I don't think it, what you're talking about. I don't think you would have minded it as much. Again, like what you said earlier, if we knew anything about those characters, yeah. like if we had, if we had, remember, there's that D Space Nine episode, and I cannot remember the character's name, but there is that character on D Space Nine, it's in like season two or season three, where she comes from a higher gravity planet. Yes. Or or or, or it's a lower gravity planet. That's right. And so she needs this exoskeleton yes. to stand up. Yep. Um and and you know and so she's disabled and so they have to like give her ramps all over the station yep. and do stuff like that. Like that is a great way. Like the whole episode is about her. So we get to know her and we get to learn and we get to understand that and she becomes a great representation for disabled people. If that gentleman cuz I remember seeing that guy in that wheelchair, if they had given a whole episode to him or if they'd given a whole episode to Ariel because the 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 fantastic thing about Ariel is that in the episode that she dies we learn that she is an augmented human, that she right. had an accident that was so bad that she basically became Darth Vader. She became right. like 90% robot. Oh, right. right? And tragic that she could only hold so many memories and stuff. I mean, that that was yeah, all really right? interesting. Her- and it's like, why didn't you introduce that all that stuff sooner? And also, maybe have, have her and all the other bridge crew, they, they could have solved a few more problems. Michael Burnham didn't need to solve everything. And she solves everything, that. and she's the most, as a military man, I'm sure you'll appreciate, the most insubordinate Starfleet person ever. How the hell is she oh, even yeah, allowed 100%. on the bridge anymore? Because what kind of captain is just, no captain, you're wrong. Really? Well, you can think about that while you spend a little time in the brig. How about that, Specialist Burnham? See you later. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, I, don't, yeah. I, don't, I didn't buy it. And again, oh no, she's great. She's the smartest woman in the room, smartest person in the room. And God, when the, when the Vulcan... Uh, and again, I think it was probably part of control at that point. But uh, the Section 31 contingent of Starfleet brass that's talking to, um, and I can't even remember the bad guy's name before he becomes control. But he, Oh, Lord, I don't know. Leland. Very good. Leland and, um, and um, what's in Giorgio and Mirror Giorgio are getting, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're debriefing Section 31. And the Vulcan asks, the Vulcan woman asks, hey, what do you think of this? And uh, Leland starts to answer. She goes, yeah, I was talking to uh, Giorgio. Thank you. And it's like, Jesus, okay. I'm like, you know, yeah, see, shut up, man. <laughs> I want to hear what the woman thinks. It's like, okay, all right. I, I, Like I said, I just felt like they hit us over the head with it. And I'm sure I sound incredibly like Archie Bunker and, uh, you know, whatever. But I, I, I didn't think I was like that because I've always loved Voyager and, and Deep Space Nine mm-hmm. and Next Generation. And uh, Dax, God, you know. Dax's whole the the great episode where uh, her former uh, wife, her former wife. God, what a great episode! Unbelievably, great. you know, it, you know, it's it's interesting because um, 
I I my for Star Trek for me is always about the family. It's yes. the idea that on a, on a micro and a macro level, because you think about Starfleet, it's all these different alien planets. They all come together, and we all work together towards one goal, even though we're complete. There was rock creatures, and there's blue people, and there's humans. And I always feel like Star Trek, on a micro level, is like that with the crew. It's the idea that like even in TOS, we have we have the Russian, we have yes. the uh, the African woman, we have the Scottish guy, Asian. we have the the Asian, we have the the asshole cowboy. Um, the Southerner and the and the and the Vulcan, and they're all completely different. And yet, at the end, they all come together towards a common goal. Like they, like to me, I'm like, oh, that's the perfect representation of like utopia as well. We're all, no matter how different we are, we all work together. And, and and that's also my biggest flaw with Discovery is that at its base core, Discovery is just about Burnham, and Burnham has become the most unique person in the Star Trek galaxy because she started the Klingon War, but now she's the only person that can wear a time travel suit. Um, yeah, so everything. So she causes all these events throughout the Star, Star Trek galaxy, <laughs> and it's not that the crew solved that problem; it's Burnham yep. solved that problem, yep. and 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 that's the reason why we're talking about like that's the reason, other reason why we don't remember half these people's names is because they've never come together as a crew, as a family. Right. And every Star Trek series does that. Even my least favorite is Voyager. I know a lot of people love Voyager. Um, but my thing with Voyager, the reason I don't like Voyager as much as some of the other ones, and the Voyager has still some amazing episodes, is that it's too much of a TNG clone. Total. But Total. I do love that crew. Yeah. And I think I that crew has an interesting dynamic. And I think Enterprise's crew has an interesting dynamic. TOS, TNG, DS9, they all have together as a family as a crew they're all great and i i do not feel that on discovery the only time i felt that on discovery was every time we cut to the enterprise and we saw pike number one and spot there you go um because i got the sense there and i want to i want to i want to frame this question to you um because they were it seems like when they made this show they were very obsessed with like okay it's got to be close to to kirk and spock like we've got to feel kirk and spock why didn't they just make the Captain Pike show set on the Enterprise before Kirk? If they wanted to do a prequel and they wanted it to be so much like TOS, instead of inventing a fake Spock sister, why not just give a Spock? Do you, do you think that would have been like, what if instead of getting Discovery, we got Star Trek The Lost Years? Sure. Well, w- would that have been better? I would have, I think it would have made fans a lot happier. I, I think. I kind of believe the have you uh, have you heard the conspiratorial theory that because this is produced by J.J. J. Abrams' secret hideout production company, um, that it's under the uh, deal that he made with Paramount uh, to make new Star Trek that it had to be twenty five percent different from canon, and there's a whole theory that even the new Picard series. Uh, there's a, there's classic Star Trek, which is the original series through Enterprise. Then mm-hmm. the events that happen in Star Trek 2009, where Leonard Nimoy, prime Spock, goes from his original universe to the Kelvin universe. They've always been very specific and said, uh, instead of saying, well, they've said it's canon. But then all of a sudden it was like, look, um, Discovery set in the prime timeline. And... Um, there, there's the theory that, that it needs to be 25% different from classic Star Trek and also that they want to license and they want to make toys. Um, I, I guess, and also the question is, how much of Michael Burnham was Brian Fuller's original idea versus going back to the well? Because the interesting thing is now that they are, I think, in response to the fans being angry, thankfully uh, came up with this Patrick Stewart idea but there's still that belief that it isn't really tied to uh, classic Trek and that it is going to be part of this prime universe that is set up in the J.J. 2009 movie and in the IDW miniseries of Countdown. And that's where their continuity is coming from. So while it will be similar to what we got in Next Generation, the fact that it is 25 years in the future makes it easier, or 20 years in the future from Nemesis, mm-hmm. makes it easier for make their own the, to make their own choices. But I wonder if, you know, staying away from a lot of that original canon stuff was because they had to keep adjusting things and making it different. I also think, too, that if they had said two things, if they had set the series in the future to begin with, a lot of, uh, a lot of our complaints would have gone away. And the other thing is... Yeah, same characters, same ship, everything. Right, yeah. and absolutely. 
And 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 also, you could even understand a cl- the Klingons deciding after a hundred years of peace or a thousand years of peace. You know, we've lost our way and get very xenophobic and very uh, nationalistic in a Klingon sense and be like, hey, you know, Kalis wasn't about, you know, making buddy-buddy with other people. We lost our way. The Kling- And so you could appreciate, but to only be 10 years before the classic series, I just, uh, and also to be as cannibalistic. And I know we hear, oh, I hate, I hate the heart of my enemy and all that Klingon stuff. I think they made the Klingons way too vicious. Like I said, I think Mir Georgia was ridiculously cannibalistic, and now all of a sudden we're supposed to like her, and she's like a likable kind of rogue. That's not a rogue. That's a that's that's a villain. That's a that's an out and out villain. And also, why does Michael Burnham have any allegiance to this person? So I mean, I, I know that like I have dance around. Yeah, your she question. looks like her mom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know. Yeah. I don't know, man. I mean, again, even Mir Spock, at least at the end of the day, was a Vulcan, and everything. But just. Ugh. I mean, yeah, I, I, yes. I, but no, I agree with you. I would love to see a Pike series, and I hope that they're considering the response that even people like us that that were disappointed in season two, we all seem to love Pike, and we all seem to love what we got with Pike. Yep. I didn't like the way they I, neutered I, Spock. Yeah. I thought they, I, I hated the idea of giving Spock dyslexia. It, that oh, help oh, me yeah. out how that's. I'm fine with that. Well, how how does that Spock uh, do what he does at the beginning of Star Trek Four? When he's surrounded by the computers and being quizzed about eight million things, if the guy's dyslexic, I don't buy that. Well, that, I, I guess the idea is that you're supposed to. The idea is that because this is a younger Spock, is that he gets over it. Okay. Um, that okay. he moves past okay. it. Okay. Um, I, I agree with you. It's a little. It's a little clunky. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think they were trying. Again, it was one of the things where they were trying to be like, well, this is why our Spock is different because he's dyslexic, and by the time that the original series starts, he's not. Um, you know, because it's like seven years before TOS, like I that. think. Yeah. I'm not yeah. certain. Something like Their that. Their timeline's weird. It is, it is weird. And, I mean, um, again, but 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 the other thing, too, is you don't know. If they just said, we're going to re like like when Ron Moore did Galactica. And it's like, look, we're rebooting Galactica. So everything you knew in the past, it's there. Enjoy the shows. But we are starting from square one, and we are moving ahead, and we're giving you a different... Way and that way, it gives us a little more opportunity to play with the characters and do different things. You could accept that. Hey, I remember everyone complaining about you're going to make Starbuck a girl. Are you nuts? Mm-hmm. Dirk Benedict, one of the best, most beloved characters. Katie Sackhoff comes in, blows us all away. Is amazing at Starbuck, and what a great idea! What a brilliant show Galactica is. Leagues better than the original. I mean, you know mm-hmm. that that goes. Well, there's saying. nothing wrong. There's also there's also nothing wrong with just staying in the same timeline but jumping ahead a hundred years and giving yeah. us brand new characters because the next generation did that too right. and and for the first two years of the next generation the tos fans were like what the hell is this yeah. oh um, yeah me as a young me as a young kid i loved it uh, uh i mean what did you think because you were a tos oh, yeah fan, and i was and an adult. watching that no live. you're right what did you think i was well you're right and i was uh, just at the end of college when tos star- or when uh, next generation started i i found the first season very clunky I like the second season better, but it still had a couple little things. I didn't mind Dr. Pulaski. I was bummed to learn why Gates McFadden was like, oh, and I thought that was really shitty because I loved her character. And I thought, that's I, like, I liked all the characters. And like you said, at least as they were going through their growing pains, you understood that this was an ensemble. They were all working together. And then, thank God, Michael Piller comes along and has the epiphany oh, yeah. of, instead of every week being the, pro- the planet is the problem of the week, Let's have a Deanna Troy story. Let's have a Worf story. Let's have a Riker story. Let's get to know these people and how the events of what's happening on another planet or whatever the problem of the week is, is affecting them. And that is what's missing from Discovery. And that is that is really, really dumb. You're not giving us a chance to know these people. You know Matthew Clark, the wonderful uh, artist, uh, he's a huge Star Trek fan. And he and I have, always have intense Star Trek conversations. And he, even ta- <laughs> and he loves Discovery. And I was even oh, and I was yeah. even asking him in the first season. I'm like, name me the bridge crew, and he could. And I'm like, well, dude, I thought I was watching carefully. I don't know any of these people's names. I, you know, it's it, and you know, more power to if you love Discovery, great, yeah. love oh, it, totally. that's awesome. Like, don't, yeah, like you know, it just says, um, I I never go in to hate something. <laughs> I never do. I always I always go into stuff to be like, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Convince me, and. 
I've just tried, man. I've tried with Discovery, and I've tried. I'm excited for Picard because so uh, Michael Chabon Me is too. the showrunner. Me too. Is he the showrunner? No. Yeah. Now, I've heard that, um, and I forget her name, but I thought another woman was the showrunner, and Michael is one of the key writers. And, I, man, as soon as they announced oh, him. Oh, I thought he was the showrunner. Interesting. I'm going to try to figure this out. I'm not sure. I, it um, been, and it might have been uh, Christian Byers, who's the... Uh, the, was the great Voyager novelist that that came on to Discovery, and I think she's the one who initially. I'm gonna I, yeah, I gotta look that up too. Um, uh, according to Wikipedia, the executive producers are Patrick Stewart, Michael Chabon, Akiva Goldsman, James Duff, Alex Kurtzman, Heather Caden. Heather Caden is who else? Uh, is probably thinking yes, about. Yes. Uh, Rod Roddenberry and Trevor Roth. I, it's weird. I'd heard it was Michael Chabon. Interesting. Well, and I. I I'd be thrilled if it is, but I thought I've heard again. You know, I'll be honest. I watched like the videos of guys like Midnight's Edge, and I don't agree with a lot of what they say, but I do kind of think they 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 seem to know what they're talking about regarding Star Trek. But um, I'm hope I am optimistic about Picard. I liked the five second teaser we got, and then I liked the mm-hmm. minute teaser we mm-hmm. we got. So I'm I am cautiously optimistic, and I'm like, hey, it's going to be a different vibe. And it's going to be a more internal and personal yeah. show. So there's a, there's a shot that this thing might work. Uh, but I do hear that there is as much uh, you know uh, tumult in between between producers and writers on this show as there's been on Discovery. And goddamn, man, Discovery went through three showrunners in two years or two seasons, mm-hmm. and we have 29 hours of Discovery. And um, again, like I said, I, I think that. Uh, Jesus, uh, Next Generation had, you know, 45 uh, stories at that standpoint. They had two stories, Discovery. Mm-hmm. Two stories. And then you... Basically, yeah. yeah. you had the little sidetracks like the Time Loop episode in the first season or even the um, the Talos 4. I, I'll, I'll even cop to liking the Talos 4 episode. I'll, I did, too. Oh, I actually liked it. But, but also, again, they kind of missed some obvious stuff, like... Having the Talosians be played by little middle-aged women that are shriveled up because they're used. I mean, the idea was these aliens use their brains, so of course their bodies have atrophied, and over the years are are frail and tiny. And instead, we get these these basketball tall men that are Talosians, and it's like you kind of miss the point of this. But all right, whatever, you know. I like the I like their makeup though. Oh, I the like the update fine. of the makeup of the Talosians. Oh, and, and, and yeah, good, you, know, you know what? Let me ask you this. Yeah, um, ask me. <laughs> How how long, how much how many seasons do you give Discovery? Um, because I weirdly don't. I weirdly think it doesn't get past season four. I wonder if it'll get, even if it's, I, even if it's. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say I, I wonder if it's going to make it to season three. Um, if it's as expensive as it's been, if they've lost mm-hmm. their partner, as they have with Netflix. Um. I, I don't I mean the rumors are that I mean you know uh, internationally Picard is going to be run by Amazon Prime and clearly there is some sort of schism between CBS in general and Netflix and the CW yeah so I don't I I will be very interested if post Picard uh, season you know three of Discovery gets pushed back unless there are guaranteed contracts. But I, I don't know. And, I mean, they've already, you know, well, they've solved a lot yeah. of the problems having the uniforms and, and sets and things like that. So they might be smart to probably do at least one more season. But it wouldn't surprise me if the next season is the last one. I think you're optimistic thinking it'll go to season four. Oh, interesting. I guess I thought I weirdly thought uh, four. But maybe they will only go three because there's that, that article that recently came out. Uh, it was in Variety or Vulture. I can't remember which one. Talking about that in the future world of streaming there's all these Netflix shows that either get canceled at season two or season yeah. three simply because once they hit season three, that's the point where many actors have to renegotiate or executive producers have to renegotiate yeah. their salaries. And, and Netflix is like, well, we have three seasons out of this and we're a buffet. So we'd rather go pay for the new show yeah. than increase our budget on you and keep paying you. Cause we're not a TV channel. We're a buffet. And unless you're a runaway hit, Forget it. So there, there is a there is a case for that too. That Absolutely. maybe all of these shows only go se- three seasons. Even though in my head, and I bet you're the same, Star Trek goes shows go seven seasons. Damn it, <laughs> they go seven seasons, and uh, that's the way it works. Well, that's certainly the old model. I, I feel like I, I, I and you know you're right, man. But all bets are off. And um, no, I, I read that those same articles as well. I didn't realize Netflix was so in hock as it is. 
and mortgaged up to yeah. the hilt because it's like okay they have like either 150 million or 180 million subscribers worldwide and you figure and maybe I'm wrong internationally by all means word balloon listeners outside of North America tell me I'm wrong but you figure it's the equivalent of 10 bucks a month so isn't that like a billion and a half or 1.8 billion dollars monthly that Netflix is like raking in from subscribers don't you think like that's enough money to fund all this stuff maybe not I don't know well, it's like every other company, man. Like they're going to get to a certain point where they they need that. Oh man, we we need that hundred bucks. We need that hundred bucks profit. You know, they, they, everybody gets to the pinching. There's that famous story uh, where Ike Perlmutter, uh, like, was walking through some office in Disney and saw that somebody had thrown away a paperclip, yep. and and then fired that person because they were wasting <laughs> money because they threw away a single paperclip. Yep. Or turning off lights and everything, and you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've always heard those crazy stories. Oh, yeah. So, like, I, I feel like every big company like this is going to get to that point where, at a certain point, even Netflix, at a certain point, they're going to be like, "Well, we need that extra five bucks. We really do." Well, what's going to happen when all these other Disney Plus and, and Warner streaming service that they're planning and everything, when they start taking these shows away from Netflix? Like, we all know uh, that Netflix spent over a hundred mil to extend their Friends contract. <laughs> And that's because Friends is one of their biggest, you know, shows. And it's like, well, you know, what's, you know, I mean, God, I constantly watch Star Trek reruns on Netflix. And they're on CBS too. Access and they're on Amazon Prime, but I end up watching them usually on, on Netflix. West Wing is another old show like that that's just good background for me as I'm doing my stuff. I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. Crazy stuff. It's weird. I don't know, man. It's also the other thing, too, is we thought when we were going to streaming that we were basically getting rid of cable. And now we've gone back to cable. We've gone back to having all these different channels that we're all paying. Like, we're paying the same amount for all these streaming services that we are, that we used to with cable. It's crazy. Agreed. And I also wonder um, how cable will live on, given that everyone is moving to this in-house model. Um, You know, I mean, well, Comcast and Universal certainly, I guess, will. that's their saving grace, that they do have the uh, Universal library to, to fall back on and everything. But, uh, you know, yeah, like I said, I mean, you know, Disney Disney Plus is really the tip of the iceberg. And I'm also hearing conflicting things that DC Universe isn't doing well uh, and isn't getting the subscribers they were hoping for. But, you know, they're just going to... I've heard that as well. Yeah, but, you know, they're going to just fold that into Warner. I mean, uh, you know... Yeah, the the Warner Brothers app is going to eat DC Universe. It's just just an idea of, like, how long does that take? Yeah. Is that next year or is it this year? Yeah, well, I I do know that, you know, the writer's room is gathered for season two of Titans... I hope we'll get a season two of Doom Patrol. Um, God, I hope so, man. Because Doom Patrol is like the best superhero show out there. No right shit, now. I know. I keep. Ra- I've been raving about so it for good. months. I agree, man. And and it was such a pleasant surprise. I shouldn't. I, yes. I mean, especially. I thought Titans was okay. At the end of the day, I mean, it's not. It's not the comic book Titans, but you you you, you know. I kind of knew that walking yeah, it's in. It's fine. But God damn it, <laughs> Doom Patrol is the comic book come to life, and I think is so. Oh, it, it, it hits, and not only just Grant's stuff, but even Paul Kupperberg's stuff, and of course the Silver Age stuff, and it's just, oh, it's so good, and I, I'm just blown away, and I've got I've got a couple of buddies that aren't regular comic readers, and they love it too, and I'm like, you guys don't get it, yeah, it's good, but Christ, this is so on the money for what we were getting in Doom Patrol mm-hmm. in the comics, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's it. I think I think the reason it's so good. Is because I think it's the one show that's on the DC Universe app that nobody looked at. I think I think all the executives were staring down Titans and were like, "We got to make sure it's good. We got to make sure it's good." I think the same thing with Swamp Thing. I think probably the same thing with Star Girl. I think Doom Patrol was the one where they were like, "Yeah, the one with the robot man. Eh, we don't care. Who cares? <laughs> Throw it out there." No, no. Um, it's I. I can't believe we have Flex Mentalo in live action. That's the insane. Hilarious. That. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. But also. Just the casting. I never remember the actor's name, and shame on me. But uh, the woman that plays uh, Rita, plays Elastic Girl. Um, oh, she's so good. I don't know her name as well. But, but it's <laughs> so Googling. funny because you uh, you see her on Two and a Half Men, and she plays you know ditzy hottie, and and it was a great comedic role, and she was really funny on on Two and a Half Men, and I think they gave her a lot of fun. April Balby. You know, way to go, April, because you are an actor's actor. Because you you went yep. from being dumb, funny, sexy girl to 
unbelievable Hollywood starlet. You're you're absolutely. I can't think of anyone else who could have done equally the job that she's doing. And I'm like, wait a minute, is that holy crap? It is. Oh my god, she is amazing. And of course, um, you know, Crazy Jane. Jesus. I mean, you know, Jane's amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, that's a great thing. And you mean Matt Bomber and and, and Brandon Fraser? You knew we we're going to be great. Timothy Dalton. You knew. You know. I mean, that was. What what amazing casting! But the women are amazingly great in it. They're just fantastic. And Mark Shepard. Yeah, that's you know. <laughs> oh yeah. That show is just so. I mean, and the fact that like Timothy Dalton is just a fantastic choice for Chief. Yes. He's so good. It's cheap. You know, it's funny. Like I'm, I've never been a huge fan of the Doom Patrol. Like I like him just fine, and I like the Morrison running quite a bit, but. I, it's interesting. This show has made me appreciate the Doom Patrol more, which is what a good adaptation should do. I agree. It's it's amazing. And uh, again, I was expecting with Dalton that maybe um, you know we'd see him at like I mean they're they're kind of doing that with the character anyway, uh, showing him at, you know at the beginning of the show and then he disappears and obviously they're searching for him. Mm-hmm. But with all the, I'm thrilled that with the amount of flashback scenes that Dalton has. Because I really did think, oh, maybe this is just stunt casting and he's really only going to be in, like, the first episode and the last episode and stuff like that. He's basically in every episode. Yeah, he really like, is. He, home, he really is. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. Um, yeah, it's weird. Yeah, it is great because it's weird when you when you saw, like, special appearance by Timothy Dalton. Yeah, you thought that. You were like, oh, he's going to yeah, he's gonna be the premiere. He's going to be the finale. But I think he's only, he's only not in one. Like, he's not in, like, episode three. But otherwise, he's in every yeah. other episode. Yeah. No, I agree. It's 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 unbelievable, and it's funny. I was talking to um, to uh, Joe Henderson about Luther, and or Luther Lucifer, and our in the last uh, word balloon that I released, and um, I uh, we can talk about Luther. Oh, I, I'm a huge. I'm very excited about Sunday and, and <laughs> Luther coming back. I think Idris Elba is amazing. That's a great show. Uh, I can, uh, but I uh, I was saying I'm like uh, they've got the guy that plays in the new Lucifer season. Uh, the Catholic priest, the exorcist uh, guy. And I can't remember the actor's name right now, but we certainly talked about him on the Henderson episode. And I'm like, he is like Mark Shepard in that he's in Creed, the first Creed movie, and he plays the British champion's manager. And he is one of those... Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. He's one of these actors that immediately when he comes on screen, you're like, who's that guy? Because you can't help but really notice and pay attention to him. And he has the same role in Lucifer. And it's so funny because I go, and I couldn't think of Mark Shepard's name. And Joe said, oh, that's so funny. He goes, you know, like, we've been trying to get Mark Shepard on Lucifer for like the last four seasons. And he's always in constant (laughs) demand being such a consummate character actor. And again, Doom Patrol is a perfect example of that. You know, he comes on, he does his little five minutes, and it's like, oh, my God, you, you, you know, that Doctor Who episode where they go back to uh, Nixon's uh, administration and he's in that episode when he played uh, Baltar's uh, lawyer in uh, Galactica. I mean, he's always great. He's the actor that's been in everything genre. Yes. I think I think the only thing he hasn't been on is Star Trek. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I haven't seen him on Star Trek. They can't afford Where's him. Where's his Star Trek They show? can't afford him. Exactly. They can't. Afford, he works for BBC. You can totally. Afford That's a him. good point. You're right about that. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff, man. All right. Well, listen. I'm gonna let you go because we've been going for about ninety now, and I, uh, as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And seriously, oh, thank you, hey, dude. Absolutely, man. No, congrats. I'm really happy that uh, things are moving along TV wise, and um, you know, when as things develop, I hope you'll come back and give us your your point of view of uh, what you're discovering in the. Uh, scripted television world and then uh super soldiers is great man it's a hell of a book and uh again coming out june 18th and uh yeah worthy of your it's attention. available at amazon and barnes and noble and all those absolutely places you can find. who uh, now are you self-publishing or did you uh, did you get somebody to uh, back this thing no i i i, I can i tricked a um a witch in the woods to publish this book <laughs> or no uh it's a it, it's an awesome company called uh, mango Publishing. fantastic they um yeah, it's one of those situations where I pitched them like three other books, and they were like, "You got any other ideas?" And I was like, "I got this soldier comic book idea," and they're like, "Greenlit." And I was like, "Oh Jesus, fantastic! <laughs> That's outstanding." But it worked out. It worked out. Absolutely, yeah. no. It's so, and I hope. Go yeah, ahead. I hope the word balloon ballooners love it. If if they if any of them pick up a copy. Well, again, I think uh, they come forward to word balloon to hear uh, interesting criticism on uh, what's going on uh, on the pages and between the pages, and uh, and again, I think it's a good representation of that. So, uh, as always, Jason Inman, well done. My best to Ash. 
And uh, when there's a new comic book or whatever to talk about, uh, you guys are always welcome back. You know that. Oh, thank you, dude. And my best to you. And uh, please stay awake during the traffic times. Don't yell at Rod Serling too much. <laughs> and, I, and I'm going to say this because I'm going to say this for everybody at San Diego Comic Con. We're all going to miss you this oh, year. Oh, thanks, buddy. Oh, you're a good man. I'll, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying hard. I'll, uh, I'll try and, uh, again, the, the injury partially kind of uh, waylaid a lot of uh, convention plans, but uh, I'll do what I can to finally get back there because, no, it's, it's, it's expensive summer camp, as I always like to say, San Diego Comic Con. Yeah, there you go, it's man. It's always a good time. Awesome. So. And, and, all, and, and I'm saying it, man. Like, I love how you're blowing up this year, dude. Oh, like, thanks, this, this podcast, I feel like – Every other day, I'm seeing somebody who I didn't know listen to your podcast tweeted out there. Um, so, like, mad props to you. And also a mad shout-out to one of my friends, Adam Drozen, who listens to this podcast. So I hope he hears. Oh, thank you. Well, thank <laughs> you for listening, Adam. Very cool. And, of course, uh, you guys are still uh, doing Geek History Lesson? Or what? what is the name of the Audio Boom uh, podcast? Yeah, that's our that's our podcast that's on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify. Yeah, Geek History Lesson, where we uh, – we got to get you on that show Anytime, one Anytime, man. I'm ready to have that Nick Fury conversation. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm going to write that down oh, right very now. Very nice. No, it'd be, it would be my <laughs> pleasure, buddy. Thanks as always. No, thank you for having me. It was an absolute pleasure, man. I love talking with you. That's Jason Inman. Uh, you got to check out his book, Super Soldiers, Comics and Service Members. It's out June 15th. It's from Mango Publishing. There's a foreword from Tom King, uh, a very cool collection of essays, Jason's observations on uh, these characters, and uh, I think it's terrific. And Jason's a hell of a writer, and I uh, know he's got a lot more in the hopper as far as his writing career, and I look forward to reading it and hopefully seeing it as well. But uh, thanks for Jason uh, for coming on. And I look forward to our next conversation. Maybe Ashley will uh, join us on our next one when they've got uh, something new to promote. But I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Word Balloon. It was all brought to you by Aftershock Comics, who are kicking ass this year in the year of reading dangerously. And uh, great books, unbelievable genre uh, features with things like Oberon, the Supernatural series from Ryan Parrott, a great vampire in the Midwest book, Dark Red from Tim Seeley. You've got Stronghold from Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly. Killer Groove, a great L.A. crime story in the 70s from Ollie Masters and Owen Marin. Also uh, Descendant, kind of a national treasure meets the X-Files from uh, Stephanie Phillips. Animosity from Marguerite Bennett, a walk through hell from Garth Ennis. Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn and Juan Doe. Donny Cates, Baby Teeth. Lots of cool books, great artists, great creators, great prices, and great comics. Check out their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond quotes on these books to order through your local shop at AfterShotComics.com. There's another episode of Word Balloon that came out today. Our buddy Joe Henderson, the co-showrunner of Lucifer, now on Netflix, season four. Of course, also his uh, wonderful book, Skyward, has been nominated as Best New Comic Series for an Eisner Award for San Diego this year. We talk about all that and more and just where television is these days with my buddy Joe Henderson on another episode of Word Balloon that dropped today. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019. 